a very good morning to all of you we have been uh, talking about fried in literature so in our last lecture we saw uh, psychoanalysis with reference to william shakespeare's famous play hamlet uh, rather he talks about uh, i'm talking about here leonel trevi who talks about Ernest Jones, Dr. Ernest Jones, and his analysis of the mystery of Hamlet. So you must have understood that, and he actually criticizes Dr. Jones for his assumption that Hamlet is central to Shakespeare's character, because you know uh, the limitations of psychoanalysis; it can't come up with the creative side of. uh what we call the author author's mind so that is one of the limitations and ernest jones does not take into consideration whereas dr franz alexander uh, in his analysis of henry the fourth he tries to illuminate illuminate means uh, throw light on the three layers of human mind through the analysis of the characters we understood that we understood that prince hal or harry uh, and his struggle is the struggle between the ego and the super ego so hal is the ego and his counterpart hotspur is the super ego that is henry percy <laughs> and uh, before conquering the super ego hotspur super ego is hotspur represented by hotspur according to psychoanalysis shakespeare didn't have this intention i'm talking about the psychoanalysis of this play by ali dr alexander so hal hal has to conquer his id and his id is represented by one more character that is falstaff now the id in this particular play is the anarchic self indulgence seen through the character of falstaff so he is means the critic dr alexander is not looking for the hidden motives which is not possible according to psychoanalysis theory he simply tries to explain it further we saw that uh, trilby talks about freud's achievements so what freud did was to show the that poetry is indigenous to the very constitution of the mind so i refer to noam chomsky in the last lecture i refer to his lad uh, he had talked about language acquisition device so poetry is very much a part of the mind it is the very constitution of the mind we say constituents the elements so one it is one of the elements of the mind and mind is seen as a poetry making organ the way we talk about language acquisition device so brain is the language acquisition device in the same manner mind is seen as a poetry making organ psychology studies mind and here mind see is seen as the poetry making organ that is freud who showed it and here he sees poetry as a method of thought actually this method of thought is not reliable it is unreal reliable and ineffective for concrete reality so we talked about dreams in the last lecture is only dreaming is not sufficient dreams are not uh, realities we can say dreams are illusions in the same manner poetry is literature is a kind of illusion okay it can't help you to conquer reality but still it is effective for the relief from mental tensions so the mind is one of its parts in one of its parts could work without logic means we think that there should be a logical uh, 
uh, thinking and all. But as we know, there are three layers of mind, three strata's. It is the illogical or irrational side of, of the mind, and it works without logic. The unconscious mind works without any logic. That is, it it recognizes no because, no therefore, no but. It is instinctive. So he, it was Freud who showed all these things through his psychoanalytical theory. And further, we refer to uh, Freud and the pleasure principle. Freud tries to go beyond the pleasure principle. In the last lecture, we understood that the eat or the irrational side of the mind. Now, just a uh, shorter before we refer to Henry the Fourth, the character named Falstaff represents this particular kind of persons or the side of mind. We seek to we try to seek pleasure, only pleasure. So Freud puts forward a new idea. It is a step beyond the pleasure principle. Beyond the pleasure principle is an essay by Sigmund Freud. And this new idea supplements, it supports Aristotle's notion of catharsis. So you are very much familiar with the term catharsis. Catharsis is the purification of mind, the purgation of the emotions which are hidden through the arousing of the pity and fear in the human mind, a catharsis takes place in tragedy. So he, this idea, beyond the pleasure principle, supports, supplements Aristotle's notion of catharsis. It means we can say it is the continuation of Aristotle's notion of catharsis. Uh, when we talk about his earlier theory, it was uh, that all dreams could be understood as the effort to fulfill the dreamer's wishes. All dreams can be seen as the effort to fulfill the dreamer's wishes. Okay, in Marathi as well, uh, we always say, Mani Vasete Sopni Dise. So this particular idiom itself is indicative of Freud's thinking. So whatever we suppress, repress in our mind, that is fulfilled through our dreams. But dreams cannot be reality. So this pleasure principle worked in dreams. For example, you have some anger for someone, for something, but you can't express it. But it is fulfilled in the form of dreams in different ways. Sometimes we may fail to understand the meaning of the dream itself. And literature is just like these dreams. The writer, the poet, expresses this anger in the form of literature. Anger, love, whatever. I'm just uh, giving an instance. Anger is one of the emotions. It can be the positive side of human mind. For example, a lover who is seeking love from his beloved and he is unable to express it. He represses that. So in that case as well, he can have dreams or he or she. So Freud reconsiders this view in beyond the pleasure principle. So what he thinks is that in cases of war neurosis, Okay, neurosis is related to neurology. Neuros means brain. Cell shock. Yes. A shock is given. The patient recollects the experience with utmost anguish. It's a war patient. If you forget something or if he has certain psychological problem, psychological trauma, then the kind of shock is given. 
and the patient recollects the experience with utmost anguish. Yes, I'm talking about the punishment given that can, you know, make the patient remember all the ex bad experiences, anguish. So in this case, there is no pleasure principle involved. The pleasure principle is involved in other cases. So he differentiates between these punishment and dreams. He says that in psychic life, psychic means the life which is related to your mind, that is mental life. In this life, there is a repetition, compulsion that goes beyond the pleasure principle. Okay, so something happens repeatedly, and that is beyond the pleasure principle. You must have seen Ghazni, the movie of Amir Khan. So he undergoes a kind of traumatic experience. A trauma is a kind of, you know, uh, pain, anguish. So this traumatic neurosis is an attempt to uh, what he says, matriotic types. This is the term from psych in psychology, that is our psychoanalysis. This is the term for medical science. Where a patient is administered small doses of poison. So this is called traumatic neurosis. And ultimately the dosage is increased and he becomes immune to poison. So you must be knowing medical science, what, what, what we do, what happens in case of vaccination now. A vaccine is made up of the virus itself. And when it is given, antibodies are created. Yes, your immune, immune system becomes strong enough to resist these viruses. So such kind of traumatic neurosis is administered, as doses are administered, and the patient becomes immune to poison. Similarly, the nightmare. Nightmare means a kind of bad dream. A person sees is an attempt to overcome a bad situation. The nightmare, the fearful dreams that a person sees is an attempt to overcome a bad situation. So you can see the comparison between that field and this field. So by repeating, by repeating it, he is making a new effort to control it. By repeating this particular uh, nightmare means seeing my bad dreams or seeing uh, what you call fearful dreams. The person is making a new effort to control it. That's what pride thinks. Now again, uh, we refer to here Aristotle's theory. If you remember it, you know, we studied it in the last semester. It is theory of the effect of tragedy. He talks about the function of tragedy. He uses different terms to talk about the function of tragedy. Means when you remember the particular definition, tragedy then it's an imitation, okay? And uh, in a language splendid and all, we, we remember it, the medium we talk about. And then ultimately, uh, we talk about the function in the last part of the definition. Arousing pity and fear. Okay. So what happens when we see a tragedy? Or when we read a tragedy? It is catharsis. So the terror we experience when we see the bleeding sightless eyes of Oedipus in Oedipus race, Oedipus Rex in the drama by Sophocles, the tragedy by Sophocles, the Greek playwright. And when we see Oedipus sins, you know, 
bleeding eyes. He has, you know, injured his eyes. So it has little cathartic function. After seeing this painful sight of a blind deepers, we become immune to the greater pain that life may inflict on us. Okay? Means after seeing that, such a such a painful situation, painful sight, we become immune to the greater pain that life may inflict on us. Means after seeing tragedies, we may realize that such kind of things can happen and we become prepared to develop immune support. For example, these days you have been, you know, listening uh, to this word, this word immunity and all frequently. So there are advertisements related to immunity boosters and all. So means what? We become ready for uh, the resistance. So Freud said that in human pride, there is the ultimate cause of human wretchedness. Wretchedness means bad quality. Badness, we can say. So in human pride, there is the cause of human wretchedness. Why men or women behave badly? The source of this wretchedness evilness lies in human pride. Okay, so man has more dignity. What pride sees, man has more dignity than any other system can give. So therefore man suffers through mental traumas. Man is an inextricable tangle of culture and biology. So that is the problem with man. Man is, you know, caught between culture and nature. Biology means nature here. The biological needs. The needs of body. And then there is a culture to control your body. Your needs, your wishes. So therefore man suffers. So if man is not simply food. Actually there is a hell within man. And this hell, the hell is waiting to you know, eat, engulf the whole civilization. Now, for example, during this pandemic situation, recently in the last month, what you saw is there was the need of an injection named Remdesivir. Of course, I am not favoring or not supporting it of that kind. Uh, means WHO had not recommended that treatment. But in India, it was going on. And people, there were people, you know, who were selling it in black. The injection which cost around 800 <coughs> a year. You know, they started you know, was, uh, in the black market, people started paying or you know, asking for 40,000 or more than that. So I came across the news. So this is what, you know. There is something, there is the hell within man. And this kind can engulf the whole civilization. So man is caught between the, the conflict of culture and nature. And for everything he gains, whatever, he pays in equal coin. So this is how he, you know, just equates Aristotle's theory with the psychoanalysis. So I hope you understood this theory. <laughs>